Well, good morning. We keep on adding weeks to this series called There is a King. I just want to talk about him. And today we're going to talk about when the king sits in the place of judgment on over every single life. All right? So this is the big idea this morning. Jesus the king is the eternal judge over all. And it is a place that you can absolutely trust him in because he is the kind of God that has experienced everything that we go through. He knows what tests and trials are. He knows what the frailty in the human body is all about. And so he has great, great mercy and great grace on us. But there is this window of time that he gives us in life that really are the testing grounds to get and prepare for, for the judgment. Um, anytime we talk about judgment issues and almost all of the imagery that arises for, <laughs> for those of you who are in the room who are conscientious on things like that, um, Anyway, uh, it just almost causes anxiety. <laughs> my mom was a school teacher, so we had some expectations on us, my sister and I did. And that means we had to bring home good grades. Um, um, anyway, so, and our, and our dad was on the school board, so that didn't help either. <laughs> so you had to bring home good grades, and um, anyway, I don't know if I exactly liked good grades, because that kind of made you a, t <laughs> a target as well. So you have to get good grades to be seen at home, but in class, it's kind of like you cover over, and hopefully, <laughs> anyway, because I did well. Um, I did well, but I tell you what, those tests every single time, <sighs> they would cause some anxiety a lot of times. Did my best to prepare, but. So every single one of us are going to stand before God, and we've all given account, and I want to talk to you about two specific judgments. It will be at the end of times. And the first one we're going to talk about actually is the last one that's mentioned. It's in the book of Revelation chapter 20. And uh, we'll look at that one first. And then we're going to back up a little bit because there's also a judgment that takes place that will where all of those who have faith in Christ will stand. And we will stand before Jesus and he will evaluate our lives. So, um, so you want to come with me? This is... Um, um, these are the words of Jesus. So let's just, let's just get, this, get this one in clear. This is some of the words of Jesus, but you will find over and over again, as you read through the red letters, if it's, in a, you know, if it's in a Bible that has the words of Jesus in red letters, you will find Jesus, that, those red letter words, over and over again that talk about the time where, where we will appear and that we will stand before him and, and he will make decisions and judgment will take place. But these are his words. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him, he's speaking of his Father who has sent me, uh, has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Now, I'm going to pause right there at that first sentence. John is recording these words of Jesus. What he is saying is that they will not be judged in the f a final judgment against sin because their sin has already been judged and it's been judged at the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he bore the judgment of God, the wrath of God against our sin. All of it was poured out on Jesus. The idea is that he is the substitute for us and stands in our place. And by the way, this is all the grace and mercy of God. Now, we're in days and age when we think that the judgment is going to have everything to do with a balance between good and evil, right and wrong. Are you, are you more good than you are bad? And if that is the case, then you're kind of a shoe-in and you'll get in at least, if not you know, front door, pearly gates, maybe there's a side, there's a back door, somewhere like that. It's amazing the kind of crazy things that you'll hear about with heaven and what's going to be there. People make up all kinds of stuff. But what John records in these words of Jesus, he's saying that eternal life comes as we receive the message that comes from the Savior, Jesus, Son of God, who dies for sin, takes penalty of our sin, and because he dies for sin, that judgment has been settled right there upon the cross. He goes on and says, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. As, uh, for as the Father has life in himself, 
So he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. So this one's clear. The Father's given Jesus every right to be the judge over all individuals. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So Jesus is really clear here. He will stand, he will judge all individuals. Now, we're going to talk about the final judgment. Often it's called the great white throne judgment because Jesus uh, comes and appears. All will be gathered before him, and there he will be, and it's on a white throne. So this great white throne judgment will take place at the end of the end of times. And you will see that there is a parousia or a snatching away of all who have faith in God and trust in Jesus as Savior. They understand the finished work of Jesus. They understand the substitutionary death of Jesus upon the cross and they believed in him. And in their belief, it's not just a mental ascent religious viewpoint, but it has to do with so their life has been given to Christ, surrendered to Christ. They've lived for him. And um, as a result, um, when they're snatched away at that point, they will see the Lord and they will be with the Lord, but they will give an account for their lives. Now what you'll find is there's a season of great tribulation and then Jesus will come again and this time he comes with all the host of heavens. We've looked at that in the, in the scripture when he shall appear in the clouds, but he will come and he will avenge all that is wrong, every evil that's been aligned against the plans and purposes of God and God's people. And he will set things right and it will be amazing what he d does because he is the conquering king in that situation when he comes and when he appears. And what you will find is he sets up then the earthly kingdom here in this life as he intended before man ever sinned. And it'll be a wonderful thing and there'll be no temptation and there'll be no sin. And we'll be here on this planet before there's a new heavens and there's a new earth and Jesus will be master and king over all of it, and everything will run as smoothly as can be. And we will be involved in uh, this administration of this millennial thousand-year rule and reign here on this earth. And when that is finished up, there will be a season of, yes, the devil will be loose, there will be temptation. Um, but uh, what you will find is, at that moment, you will find this calling forth for all to give an account before him. This is Revelation chapter 20, it's starting in verse 11. John writes and says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I love that. In other words, he shows up and he sits on the throne, and just the expanse of his glory just pushes everything else out of the way. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. By the way, we're not for sure exactly what all these books are. But it all has to do with giving an account and the judgment that will take place. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, Warren Wiersbe says the great, uh, the white throne judgment will be nothing like our modern court cases. At the white throne, there will be a judge, but no jury, a prosecution, but no defense, a sentence, but no appeal. No one will be able to defend himself or accuse God of right unrighteousness in any way. This judgment is a judgment for all who have died and rejected Christ or refused to bend to the authority of Christ. This is for all the sinful and those, uh, anyway, wicked, they will appear before God. Everyone who has pushed him away from the mercy that he had for them within his life. There's some things that are just very, very clear. 
In this final judgment, all will be judged before the king. It will be absolutely comprehensive. Everyone will stand before him. Um, and by the way, when I say everyone, this is talking about all those who, who are not in Christ. We're going to head to this other judgment for those who are believers when we stand before him. But at this moment, the mercy factor is no longer in play. It has been settled. It is settled in the way that we live our lives, when we live our lives and what we will do, whether we believe in the, in the, in the full uh, sacrifice of Jesus for our sin. You see, mercy factor is no longer in play because at that point, we're not going to negotiate with God. What we've done really basically is we've chosen our way through life. And that's what we will be evaluated and judged upon. Now, the key is the book of life. That is the key document that's used here. Um, in salvation, when it takes place, you will find that there is a moment that happens when we are saved. We have bent, we've submitted to him, we've come to the realization I'm a sinner before God and I need the forgiveness of God, I need a savior. And when we come to him and bend to him, and it really is, has to do with the life of repentance and when we do that, we invite him to come and the Bible says that he is faithful and he comes and washes away all of our sin. It's the most marvelous thing. It's the finished work of the cross. And in that moment, there is a transformation that happens where we are changed and we are brought from death into newness of life. And it's in a moment. And we have a new nature. It's the nature of Jesus that comes and lives inside of us. And the Bible says that we are uh, brought up and we are raised up in Christ Jesus and we are seated in him in heavenly realms. And the idea is that we are pure and spotless, completely washed, totally forgiven, and it's all the grace of God. It's not what we do. It's not the good stuff that we would do. We're not earning our way into heaven. This is just the mercy and grace of God. So that none of us can stand here and boast. And we don't compare ourselves to other individuals. It's all just through the goodness of Jesus. Jesus is going to be the hero in heaven. Jesus is going to be the king. It's going to be all about Jesus when we get there. Because we will understand as never before the only way that we have entrance into the place to be in the presence of God. It has all been just opened up through Jesus. So in that moment, it is a solitary moment that the old things are passed away and all things become new. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we have a righteousness that's not our own. It's the righteousness of Jesus that he clothes us with. It's a marvelous moment. It is a mystery, it is beyond our comprehension, but that's what the scripture says of us. We are new creatures in Christ. So we can stand here and sing, my chains are gone. I've been set free. And it's what? It's all the amazing grace of God. That's what that is. But also the Bible talks about there's still, there's this progression that takes place because we're being redeemed also. We're being saved. We're being changed. Can you see the graph that I'm making right here? Okay. being forced to watch myself online, it's a painful thing. <laughs> One thing I love about the second service is we usually don't record, but I understand we're recording there, so welcome to all those who are watching this right now. But I just made a graph, okay? So here's this, here's this, okay? In Christ Jesus, seated heavenly realms, but we're also becoming like what we're already declared legally by God, all right? And that's a transformation and change, and it is a process, and sometimes it's a painful process because more of what we need to yield to him, and that's where things like our temper and our, the old fallenness of the old nature, there's some residue that's around, and we have to just continue to yield to God. But that's, that's the, by the way, that's the work of the grace of God as well. That gives us a want-to that I want to be like Jesus. And so we're transformed and we're changed. But I will tell you in a moment, our names are written in the book of life. And that is God's goodness and grace. I do need us to understand also that all, this, all these, this judgment of God, all this judgment that takes place for all individuals will be thorough, but it will also be equitable. Individuals that want to, I don't know, somehow complain and assault God's character by saying a good God would never do these things or would never, a good God will, will bring justice. Just a good judge is going to be a judge that will say there's got to be something about, about 
uh, following law that matters, the kind of you know, law that is set for, uh, to keep the boundaries, where we play nice in life. Um, we want a judge that will bring about equity and justice and, and, and what is right, and God will do that. Our problem is we so often underplay the fallenness of humanity. And we think that God has a big white beard and he's old and we'll be able to like pull something over on him. We have shaped a God in our own image and we've shaped entrance into heaven by our efforts, by our goodness. And we just want to think that he's going to completely judge on the curve, but that we're going to be involved in that. I just want to tell you, none of us are going to sit on that throne. It is only Jesus. And that's why I want to talk to you about that. So many people today um, have false concepts of this judgment, but also of heaven. And next week <laughs> is the last of this series, but I want to talk to you about the king of heaven, what it's going to be like there. But there's also a concept of hell that is very real, that Jesus talks about and is very clear. In this great white throne judgment, it speaks that these dead are judged. They've been raised out of death. They stand before God and God will loose them into the path that they have chosen, and it will be everlasting darkness and perishing apart from God. Now, I want to talk to you about the believer's judgment. This one's real as well. We don't talk about this much in church. It is called the judgment seat of Christ. You are going to find some verses concerning that here. Uh, let's just head to them. There are three prime passages, that, um, but you'll find others as well. But let's start with this one, Romans chapter 14, verses 10, 11, and 12. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This is written by the Apostle Paul, what he's challenging the church at Rome to do. Is he's just saying, hey, listen, withhold this idea of that you've got to, you know, bring judgment of everyone. And he, he really talks about reserve the spot for God because we'll, we'll all stand before him and we will all give an account. So, uh, so leave that one up to God. Uh, this is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And fire will test the quality of each person's work. For what has been built, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So... Um, Paul uses these powerful illustrations to a church that's really confused because they're arguing over which teacher they follow and which of the apostles has had the biggest influence upon their life. Paul comes and says, listen, it's, it's not about me and it's not about others. Um, there's, you know, some, some plant the seed and some water the seed, but it's God who gives the increase. So I don't need competing values within the church of who's your favorite preacher and uh, who's your favorite teacher of the scriptures. But uh, instead, what we're doing is we are all building on one foundation, and that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let me take you to one other passage. This is in 2 Corinthians, and it's chapter 5, one verse. For we must all appear before the, and here's where the phrase comes from, the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this is the judgment that will be for all followers of Jesus. And this one will not be a judgment of whether we get into heaven or not. All right. What this judgment will have to do with is it will evaluate our lives and what we've done. Uh, it will evaluate down into uh, even the, the condition of our heart. And, and let's just sum it up this way. I think this one's fairly clear. 
the criteria for this judgment really focuses in on, so what did you build your life upon? What was the foundation? Paul's saying, if we're going to stand before Jesus the judge, was he the foundation of the building blocks of your life? Did you really live your life for Christ? Okay. In addition to that, it has to do with what materials did you use? Did you catch that? So he's talking about fire will come. And what was built with uh, straw, what's built with wood, the kind of materials that are combustible. When this judgment comes, it's the evaluation that takes place. But the stuff that's really the solid stuff, um, that's going to that's gonna last through that testing. So what did you build with? What were the kinds of materials? And then in addition to that, it really talks about the motives of the, the heart. So why did you build what you built? Did you do that for yourself? And by the way, this is, this is why in many ways, when judgment does take place because God sees through everything so clearly, he knows why we do what we do. He knows whether it's about a reputation for us and it's about just pride issues, um, uh, competitive issues, or was this really about the issues of we lived our life just for the honor and the glory of God? And by the way, this is part of the reason in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talks about your acts of righteousness and he talks about giving and he talks about fasting and he talks about praying. And those three things that he mentions very clearly, he warns against the behavior of the Pharisees because he says they like to do it, but they like to do it for a show to everybody to, to talk about how pious they are, how righteous and holy they are. And then he says this, but when they do this as a display of their righteousness before other people, other people will go, oh, you are so much more spiritual than I am. And that in and of itself is their reward because you got your recognition with individuals. So you feel good about yourself, but when you stand before God, there'll be no reward whatsoever because what you really were about was you were about the, the kudos that would come in this life and what people would think about you. And there's no pretending before Jesus. And there's no pretending even now before God. So what Jesus says is this. So when you give, you don't, you don't blow trumpets so everybody can see what you've done. But what you do, and he talks about not letting your left hand know what your right hand is. The idea is that um, let it be about something that is much more private and devotion to God. And he talks about our public prayers. There's going to be public prayers that take place, but it's not about how devout people will think we are. What Jesus says is you head into your prayer closet and you pray. If you really believe that prayer matters and that God will hear it, then tuck yourself away where it's only you and God. Where it's only you and God and you know that he hears you and you talk to him and you pray to him and the God that hears you while nobody else is watching, he will reward you openly. Okay, and that's the idea behind all of these kinds of things. So what are you going to do with your life? What kind of life are you going to build? It's going to be about accumulating stuff. Is it about accumulating, I don't know, a reputation? Is it about pretending? I've got to tell you a story. I know I've got some basketball players that are in here. Cotton Fitz Fitzsimmons, who was a basketball coach way back in the day, NBA coach, so he's coaching a losing team, and they're at the bottom of the division, and they're taking on the Boston Celtics. And this is when Boston Celtics were in a dynasty, and they're just crazy good. And so what he's doing is he's going to go ahead and give them the motivational speech <laughs> that will hopefully help this pathetic team to somehow compete with the Boston Celtics. So he hits the idea to motivate the players in, in his pregame speech Something like this, he says, gentlemen, you need to go out there tonight and instead of remembering that we're in last place, pretend that we're in first place. Instead of being, being in a losing streak, which we are, but pretend that you're in a winning streak. Instead of being a regular game, pretend this is a playoff game. With the, that, the team went all charged up onto the basketball court and they were just absolutely trounced by the Boston Celtics. Well, Coach Fitzsimmons was upset about the loss, but one of his players came up, slapped him on the back, and says, it's okay, Coach, cheer up. Just pretend that we won. <laughs> <laughs> you can pretend all you want, but when we stand before Jesus, he'll just know everything. It's so clear. Whether we built our life and the foundation and uh, the, the life upon him, but also the kind of materials and what did we build with and 
you spend your life with all of this, and, but did it make any difference? And on the motives even of why did you do that? And that's, by the way, when we stand before God and uh, there will be some individuals that will come away with just such amazing, and by the way, there are five different kinds of crowns that are mentioned in the, in the New Testament. Crowns of victory, crowns of, anyway, but it talks about uh, everlasting crowns and um, but the reward that will take place for, uh, for what we have done, there's some individuals that's going to blow our minds because it just didn't seem to be, it wasn't recognized at all and didn't seem to make any difference. And there are other individuals that we think are going to come out with like crowns hanging all over the place and uh, they may make it in and some, 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 some aren't even in. Um, they're not really putting their faith and trust in Christ as Savior. But uh, it will be amazing, and I will tell you this, that Jesus will stand and he will judge rightly. It will be complete. Um, I want to clear this one up. In this judgment of the, the, the Bema seat, of the judgment seat of Christ, one er erroneous idea that we've grown up around the judgment seat of Christ is that it's a judgment that will take place in heaven, at the time of death to determine whether a person is permitted into heaven. But that is not the case. Uh, we have already, this is for the redeemed who've already come into Christ. It's not whether we get into heaven. J. Dwight Pentecost uh, uses these powerful words. The only judgment to which a believer will ever have been subjected is the judgment on the cross. That's it. He was judged in the person of Christ. Jesus Christ has borne his judgment and there need not be any examination to see whether a child of God is permitted into heaven, into glory, because the presence of the Holy Spirit in that believer is the believer's right to enter in without judgment or examination. So what will this evaluation, what will this judgment be? It will be according to what we have done and there will be reward. And so therefore, every single one of us, by the mercy of God, when we enter in to see Jesus and our lives are evaluated, we will be grateful that we are there. But I also just want to talk about this because I believe it's absolutely necessary for all of us so when we do stand before Jesus, we won't somehow have the light turned on and realize, you know, I really did waste most of my life. Why did I do that? Why did I live like that? Why kind of that foundation or materials or, or motives? Why did I do that? Now, the conclusion of this judgment is going to be twofold. There will those be those that suffer loss of what they thought would be reward. Okay, And it's because things have been done in the energy, in their own energy, for their own reputation. It really was about them, not for the, for the glory of God. And therefore, there's no reward. However, there are other individuals that when they stand before God, there will be great reward um, because of um, their, their faithfulness to God. And so I want to encourage you in this. I want to encourage you to live your life with a real sense of submission and reverent fear in this life. Even when we talk about end time things, I know religious people that want to argue over timetables and all those kinds of things, and I think there are some things clear on timetables, but I'm just going to tell you this. None of us have control over the times of God. We're just supposed to always be watching and waiting for him, okay? Our lives should be just submitted in uh, reverent fear before God, and even when we hear about this final judgment that will take place, there should be a real deep sense inside of us of just, you know what? I need to take life seriously. Like Scotty mentioned, the kind of what he's entrusted into my life, I just need to use it for his honor and glory. There also needs to be a sense of a diligent obedience to the mission of Christ. Uh, what we spend, uh, finances, time, all of the resources that God blesses us with, there does need to somehow be something involved with something that's eternal. That's why missions and all those kind of things, and local church and keeping a good local church in a community, so, so vital for us. What we do with our time, what we do with our words, what we do with our mental energy toward encouraging others and pointing the way to Jesus, so crucial. And then growing in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Let me just share this with you. This is from 2 Peter chapter 3. 
And uh, in about one month, we got a few months just breaking out of uh, message series, but uh, toward close of February, we're going to head into uh, a series on First and Second Peter. I really feel led to go ahead and teach through those two epistles, those two letters. And in chapter 3, Peter writes in, se- in his second letter, Second Peter, he talks about the issue of that the end of times are coming and there will be mockers and people who scoff and they'll say, when is this coming of Jesus that you talk about? And um, Peter says, listen, they, they, they may sit back and say it's never going to happen, but God's not slow like people are slow. He's not slow in keeping his promise as, as you would understand it, but what he is is he's patient. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance, and so he's wanting his house full. He's wanting a big family. But then Peter says, but that day will come and it will be like a thief. And the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way. And then come these words. What kind of people ought you to be? And he goes on from there and he says, you need to live holy and godly lives. These are lives that are different, set aside for God's purposes. And then three different times he talks about, and look forward to the day of God. And look forward to the new heaven and new earth. Look forward to this and make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We have some parents in the room, you know what it's like to be at conflict with your kids. It might not always be their fault, but a lot of times it's the emerging of their independence. They're their own person. They want to do it their way. And sometimes you just want to say, I know, but when you have a house of your own, you can establish your rules, but you're under my roof. I've used that speech before. You're under my roof, and these are the rules, and somebody has to have some rules, and this is what we're going to go by. All right? There's the door. (laughs) You don't like the rules. Sometimes you go through those kind of things. But it's hard when you live, and it's hard when you're in conflict with one. One of the last places you ever need to have conflict in in your life has to do with the king. Because everything that he establishes and every guideline and way that he has for you, actually there are ways that are established for your blessing. There's an enemy that robs, kills, and destroys us, but God will never do that to you. Okay? So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we teach our children these things. You follow this marvelous way of God. Because with it comes and ushers in the blessing of God into your life. Peter winds up and he says, so you've been forewarned. I've told you the truth. So be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. What do I mean by the lawless? They don't want to live under the governance of a king. They don't want to submit to him. I want to do it my way. Don't let that get into your system and be infected by that. Um, and he goes on and says, and fall from your secure, secure position, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Life should uh, be all about just uh, the farther we get along in life, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing our bodies grow more frail. And as our bodies grow more frail, but there's opportunity for our spirits to just get strong and strong and strong as can be. Uh, when you walk with the Lord, whether it's 20 years or longer, but, um, what happens is you just get to know him better and things that used to frustrate you doesn't as much because you just know that he's got it all under control. And we grow in the grace, his grace, and we grow in the knowledge of who he is. And um, there's going to be a transition and change that will take place for all of our lives with when this frame is finished, in that moment, the body will separate, this is not, the the spirit will separate from the body and and we will be with the Lord. So I want you to follow after Jesus and I want you to keep him right in the center and first forefront of your life. I'm telling a story, and if there's anybody that's doing music, now's the time to come. I missed that in the first service. Back in 1952, that's way back in the old days, even before I was born, 
And Florence Chadwick was a lady swimmer, and she had the goal of swimming from Catalina Island on the off the west coast of California back to the mainland to California coast. Well, the day that she had set, there's the boat that's going to be going along next to her. She's got people that are there to cheer her on. It is a windy day. It is a cold day. The waves are high, and it's foggy. And she swims, and she swims. She hits the wall. She grows tired. She starts to say, I don't think I can do this, and asked, pull me from the water. But the people in the boat that were shadowing her says, you can do it. You can make it. Stay in there. Hang in there. But she just couldn't. So they pulled her into the boat. When they pulled her into the boat, it was just moments after they did that, that all of a sudden the fog lifted. And when the fog lifted, she realized that she was just a short distance from the shore. She could see it. And it just felt like she would never, never, never make it. She said, you know, I might have made it if I had kept the shoreline in mind. Well, it was two months later. She does it again. She gets in the water at Catalina Island, and guess what? It's a foggy day, foggy morning, and it's windy and the waves are high. But she began to swim, and as she began to swim, fatigue sets in. She hits the wall. But she kept swimming. She made it all the way to the shoreline. When she arrived there, she said, I made it because I always kept the image of the shoreline in mind. Life seems really long for us here. Um, they will say that days are long, but the years are short. Does that make sense? And when you have those long days, somebody said to me this morning, good days, bad days. When you have those long days, those are especially the days that we have to really, we really have to work on our focus. Um, Jesus talks, the, the scriptures talk about Jesus and for the joys that were set before him, he endured the cross. He despised its shame, but he endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. So for all of us in the room, I trust that you are a follower of Jesus. If not, why don't you come to your senses? Just come to your senses. There's a merciful God, and now is the window and the season of mercy for your life right now. For you to just come to him and say, Jesus, I believe that you're the Savior of the world. I need you as my personal Savior. Invite him in. And as you invite him in as king, then you have to follow him as king. But you follow him all the way to, the uh, Bible a lot of times talk about heaven's shore. There's all kinds of songs that throughout the history of the church that talk about keeping your eyes on heaven. One of them is, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. One glimpse of his dear face, all others, all sorrows will erase. It's this idea that uh, sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's a fight. One day soon, our eyes will behold him, and he'll tell us to enter into his rest, into our rest. Bow your hearts with me, would you please? I don't know if you have confidence that you're going to face Jesus in his judgment, or, or if you will face him when he is upon that great white throne with all the masses who have rejected the way of salvation. I want you to have confidence in that. You don't need to have anxiety and worry and fear over that. You need to have confidence in the finished work of Jesus. So let's pray. And if you need to come to Christ today to submit to him as king, just in the depth of your heart, why don't you say, Jesus, I believe you are the king. You came once. When you did, you came to die for my sin. When you come again, I want to be at that appearing where you're going to snatch me away to give me new resurrection body and the reward from faithfulness to you. I want to live a life like that. 
So Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash it away. I believe you settled the wrath of God against my sin. And I want to thank you for all of your mercy and grace. I embrace you now. Lead and guide my life. I believe in you. And I believe that you're able to keep me from falling and will bring me all the way to the place, the home that you'd prepare for me. So I trust you, Jesus, with my life. If you're in the room and you're a believer, let's just yield to him, shall we? Why don't we stand together? I want you to take a moment and just, uh, let's just say, oh, Lord, help me. We ask of you, O oh Lord, when we look at your word and what Peter challenges us to and ask that question, what kind of people ought you to be? Lord, we come to you and we ask that you would give us all of that grace, all of that power and strength that you have for us to live lives that reflect the holy nature of Jesus. That there's a sense of godliness inside of us. We can exercise to give strength to our physical bodies but you tell us to go ahead and head into the kind of training that produces a, a godliness and a righteousness that is really after the nature of Jesus. You tell us three times, God, to look forward to this day and to look forward to the new heaven and the new earth and to look forward, O oh Lord, to this time when we will see you and um, help us, O oh Lord, that when we come before you, Lord, that there's this sense of being at peace with you, uh, that our, our walk is blameless and spotless just because of uh, your great grace. So even as we hear the warnings from your scripture, may we be good and faithful servants and be ready for your appearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time, would you sing this with me? But my chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing grace Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. There's a verse that says this. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, oh, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first began. My chains are gone. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending joy, amazing grace, unending love. Unending love, amazing grace. Hey, it's been great to have you today here at Life Christian Fellowship. Uh, look forward to that day. It's coming. It's coming soon. And uh, let this uh, week be a week of just uh, looking up, being ready, and uh, just letting him forge the image of Jesus inside of your life. If you'd like prayer before you go, come on down to the front. We would be glad to go ahead and partner with you in prayer. In the meantime, go in the grace of God and just have an awesome